In this video, we're going to focus on the derivative of inverse functions. Remember from algebra or pre-calculus that the definition of an inverse function is that you take a one-to-one -one function, passes the vertical and horizontal line test, like maybe the cubic function, and you swap the x and y variables to get the function that undoes the cubic function. That would be the cube root function, which kind of looks like this. These two functions, both one-to-one -one functions, satisfying horizontal and vertical line tests, are mirror images across the identity function y equal x. In this particular section, we're going to be taking a look at how to find the derivative of the inverse function without actually taking the derivative of the inverse function. As we'll see, it's the reciprocal of the derivative of the function with the inverse function substituted in place of the variable, which doesn't require us to find the derivative of the inverse function at all. It does, however, require that we know both the function and its one-to-one -one inverse. If it is not a one-to-one -one function, as in a parabola, x squared, we can chop off one arm and say, for x greater than or equal to zero. That will give us the square root function from zero to infinity. These are important because they will allow us to finally get the power rule for rational exponents, which is an important result that we need to prove. It will also allow us to find the derivatives of the inverse trig functions, arc sine, arc cosine, arc tangent, and so forth. Once that's done, however, the truth is that we won't use this particular formula that frequently. So in terms of importance, it's not hugely important, except that it does give us the two important results of the power rule for rational exponents and the derivatives of the arc trig functions. Now we only have two learning objectives, which is to calculate the derivative of an inverse function and recognize the derivatives of the standard inverse trig functions, arc sine, arc cosine, arc tangent, arc cosecant, arc cotangent. Let's go ahead now and I'll share my screen and we can look at the derivative of an inverse function. The derivative of an inverse function is best explored first by looking at a graph and realizing the relationship between the function and its inverse. In this particular case, I'm gonna highlight both the function and the inverse. I'm going to highlight the function here in blue. And I'm going to highlight the inverse function. Well, maybe purple isn't a great color, but I'll do it in purple. This is the inverse function of f. Note that they make a mirror image across the identity function, which is normal for an inverse and a function. The identity function gets its name, y equal x is the identity function, because it is the only function that is its own inverse in three different ways. Let's talk about the three different ways so you can remember the relationship between the function and its inverse. First, in order to find the equation of the inverse, we take the equation of the function and we swap the x and y variables. I'm gonna look at this function f of x and say that f of x is equal to x squared plus two, but only for values of x greater than or equal to zero. When I look for the inverse, I swap the variables. I replace the function notation with y, and then to get the inverse, which I label inv for inverse, I replace y with x and x with y. I still have the requirement that this variable 
for x in the function is greater than or equal to zero. And that means now that in the inverse, what was x in the function is now y. So y is greater than or equal to zero. Notice in the original function, that because x was strictly greater than or equal to zero, the y values ended up being greater than or equal to two. This means that on the inverse, I'm going to have y greater than or equal to zero and x greater than or equal to two. The relationship between these two equations is swapping the variables. Now I solve again for the y value by subtracting the two and then taking the square root. This is going to give me the square root of x minus two. You may be wondering why I don't have the plus or minus. My y, which I've solved for, must be strictly non-negative, greater than or equal to zero, which is gonna be the principal radical the positive square root of x minus two. And note that when x is two, I do get zero for the y value. Let's plot those two points on the graph. Here, when x is two, I get a y value of zero. Its mirror image point on the original function is that when x is zero, y is two. Notice that we not only swap the x and y variables in the equations to find the equation of the inverse, but we can take each point and swap their x and y variables to get the points that form a mirror image across the identity function. If I fold along the identity function, these two points will touch exactly. Now on the identity function, we have the equation y equal x, which includes points such as two, two. If I swap two, two, you got it, I still have two, two, which makes the identity function somewhat unique. There's a third way that they are their own derivative, and that's by folding along the identity function. So we have algebraically by swapping variables, point to point by swapping coordinates and graphically by folding along the identity function. The identity function is the only one that is its own inverse all three ways. There are other functions that are their own inverse by folding on the identity function and by swapping variables, not point to point. The prime example would be the rational function one divided by x. It is its own inverse. The inverse is again one divided by x, and it folds on top of itself when folded on the identity function. But one divided by x has points like, well, two comma one half. And when I swap the coordinates, I don't get two one half, I get one half two. It's not the same thing when I swap the ordered pairs. They are still symmetric points across the identity function. They just aren't the same point. Only one function has this characteristic that it works all three ways. And so we called it the identity function, y equals x. When I'm looking at the graph of the function highlighted in blue compared to the function highlighted in purple, I want to look at a particular point on the inverse. So I pick a value of a and I substitute a into the inverse function notation. You'll notice that we can replace y in the inverse by writing f inverse of x equals the square root of x minus two. The negative one is written in the power position but it does not mean take the function to the negative one power, nor does it mean the negative one derivative. It means take the function f and invert it, and you get a new function, which is the square root of x minus two. Both of these functions pass the vertical line test and the horizontal line test, so we say they're one to one. 
In this case, if I have the point A, F inverse of A, and it's read F inverse, not F to the negative one, then on the function, I must have the ordered pair symmetric to it across the identity function of F inverse of A, A, which is this point here. Now let's consider taking a point a little bit further along on the tangent line. When I'm looking at this point, A, F inverse of A, I can compute the slope of the tangent line and graph the tangent line at that point. If I take another point on the tangent line, then I can find that the derivative of the inverse function at A, F inverse derivative prime of A is given by the ratio of P divided by Q. What about the derivative at its mirror image point, F inverse of A, A? If I do a similar thing to the function and I compute the derivative of the function, notice that I get the same triangle, but with the relationship inverted. They're reciprocals of each other. The slopes of their tangent lines are reciprocals, not inverses, reciprocals. To invert is to swap the x and y variables. To take the reciprocal means you turn the fraction upside down. The slope on the inverse function is p divided by q. The slope on the original function of the mirror image point is q divided by p which means that F prime of F inverse of A gives me Q over P. This is going to give me a relationship that I can exploit in order to find the slope on the inverse function. Because if F prime of the inverse at A is Q over P, the reciprocal of this would give me P over Q which is the slope of the inverse function. That's the derivative. Now let's go ahead and look at the actual theorem. The theorem says that to find the derivative on the inverse function at a point A, you take the reciprocal of the derivative of the original function with the inverse function substituted inside of it. In other words, the derivative of the function at the value of f inverse of a is giving me q over p, but one over q over p is p over q, and that is the slope of the tangent line on the inverse function at a. Now, this is probably only going to be useful if we happen to know both the original function and the inverse function, which means that it's not always very useful, except that we need it to prove two important results. Here's the theorem that we have for this particular situation. We have to have a function that has a one-to-one -one inverse and is differentiable. Then the inverse function has a derivative which corresponds to the reciprocal of the derivative of the function at the inverse function. In other words, the derivative of f is composed with f inverse of x. This gives us the formula that we see here. If we call g the inverse of x, then our formula simplifies to the derivative of g becomes one over f prime of g of x, which is a little bit easier to remember. Let's now look at example one with the original function g of x equals a one divided by x plus two. This is a rational function and it's been shifted to the left by two, which means that it has a vertical asymptote at negative two. It basically comes down and looks something like this. 
that is the derivative we want to find, the derivative of that graph there, the rational function. We're going to do it by doing it two different ways. We're going to use the inverse function of it to find it using the formula, and then we'll do it directly, and we'll compare the methods. To use the formula, we have to know what function g is the inverse of. And remember, when functions are inverses of each other, it works in both directions. If f is the inverse of g, then g is the inverse of f. They undo each other and get you right back to x. That's the key thing about inverses. When you compose them, you just get x, the identity function. So we're going to apply our college algebra skills. We're going to take our equation for g of x, replace g of x with y, and swap the variables. This will allow us to find the inverse. We know it's one to one because we know what the graph of the original looks like. And it does pass the vertical and horizontal line test. First, we replace g of x with the variable y. Then we swap the variables. My recommendation is label that step i and v so you don't swap again. Believe it or not, I've seen students swap twice which means you're dealing with the original function again. Then we want to cross multiply to try to isolate the y variable. I could multiply it out, but I'm after y, which only shows up inside parentheses. So I chose to divide by x instead. Then to isolate y, I subtract 2 from both sides. I get the equation 1 divided by x minus 2. I could also write this equation in a form with a common denominator as 1 minus 2x, also divided by x. This is the inverse function to our original function, g equal to 1 over x plus 2. Let's write down the two functions that we now have. These functions undo each other. Now what I want to do is I want to apply the formula to find g prime. To find g prime, I take the derivative, and this is going to give me 1 over the derivative of the function at g of x. I'm assuming here that g is actually the inverse function. But basically, what I need to do is I need to take the opposite function, its inverse's derivative, and substitute it on the inside. When I do that, I get the following. I take the derivative by finding f prime of x. When I write the 1 over x as x to the negative 1, I get negative x to the negative 2, or negative 1 over x squared. The derivative of the minus 2 would be 0. So this becomes the derivative of this function right here, which is the inverse of g. Then I'm going to substitute. So now I'm going to take this negative 1 over x squared and substitute the original function inside of it. This will give me the derivative of g without actually computing the derivative of g. In this case, we have a compound fraction, a complex fraction. So in order to clean it up a little bit, we need to go ahead and take the reciprocal of the denominator to multiply by. This f prime of g of x, this fraction here, represents what goes in the denominator of the derivative of g. So this becomes 1 over negative 1 over the quantity 1 over x plus 2 all squared. I know, it's a little crazy. The main division bar is between the 1 and the negative 1. Take the reciprocal of the bottom fraction and multiply it by the 1 in the numerator. 
leading to one divided by x plus two, the quantity all squared. Now, I also have the negative still floating around. So my final result, because one squared is one, is negative one divided by the quantity x plus two squared. That's how you apply the formula. It's not simple and it's not short. We could do it in either direction since they're both inverses of each other. Let's now take a look at finding the derivative of g directly without using the inverse function. I would rewrite one divided by x plus two as quantity x plus two to the negative one power. And then I would invoke the chain rule. The power on the outside is going to come to the front and then get reduced by one to negative two. And I leave the inside as x plus two and multiply by the derivative of the inside. This gives me negative one over quantity x plus two squared very quickly. You can tell that using the formula is not short. Again, we mostly need the formula to prove some important results that we need to continue our study of calculus. Most of the time, applying the chain rule is easier. Let's now go ahead and turn our attention to problem number two. In this problem, I want to find the derivative of g of x by applying the inverse function theorem. I know what the inverse of g is. The function fifth root of x has an inverse of x to the fifth. These functions are both one-to-one -one already, so I don't need to restrict the domain in it, like I had to do with the parabola earlier. In order to find the derivative of g, I'm going to compute the derivative of f, substitute g on the inside, and then take the reciprocal of it. Let's write down the formula to make sure that we remember what we're doing. In this case, I want to compute g prime of x, and the derivative is going to give me the reciprocal of the inverse function to it, f prime, with g of x substituted on the inside. Now, the derivative of x to the fifth is going to give me five times something to the fourth power. And what I want to substitute on the inside is the fifth root of x, my value for g of x. What does this give me? Remember that the fifth root can be written as the one-fifth power. So I have x to the one-fifth power raised to the fourth power. That looks a little like a six. Then I can multiply the two powers together to get one over five x to the four fifths. You can also write this as one fifth x to the negative four fifths. It's hard, but you need to try to get your exponents to stop at the tops of your variables and not to continue down towards the line. Let's now turn our attention to the next example. Looking at example three, we have the function, the square root of x minus four and the point two eight, which is on the function. No, that's not on the function. It must be on the inverse. So what we're looking at is we're taking the function f of x and we're trying to compute the inverse function's derivative. The inverse function is given by y equals x squared plus four with a restricted domain. Why does that happen? The original function f has a restricted domain that x has to be greater than or equal to four or we get a negative under the radical. This means that the y value turns out to be greater than or equal to zero. On the inverse, what was y becomes x, and this means our y value 
will be greater than or equal to four on the inverse. To find the inverse, again, you replace f of x with y, then solve by first swapping the two variables. Label this step inverse. This gives me x equal the square root of y minus four. To get to the y, I have to square both sides, which is risky and can include false solutions. Keep that in mind later this semester when you're doing other work. This gives me the equation y equals x squared plus four, which you see given to you here. Now, how can I use this information to find the slope of the tangent line to the inverse function x squared plus four restricted to x greater than or equal to zero? This point, 2, 8, is not on the function, but it is on the inverse. So we can find the equation of the tangent line at point P on the inverse. First, we need to find the derivative of the inverse function, which yes, you could do directly, but we're trying to learn to use the function formula. So we're going to find the derivative with respect to x of f inverse of x, which is also f inverse prime of x. By finding f prime of f inverse of x. The original function f is the square root of x minus four. To find its derivative, we need to apply the chain rule. This is going to give me one over, well, the derivative of a square root is one over two, the square root, threes the inside, times the derivative of what was inside the radical, which would give us one. However, instead of writing x, I want to write the function, which represents the inverse function. So instead of x minus 4, I get x squared plus 4 minus 4. This is going to simplify to 1 over the primary division bar, 1 over 2 times the square root of x squared. You know that's a piecewise defined function, which gives you x for x greater than or equal to 0, and negative x for x less than zero. In our case, x is restricted to be non-negative, so the square root of x squared is in fact x. This gives me one divided by one divided by two x. And then I can keep track of the fact that the primary division bar is between the ones, which makes two x, the denominator of the denominator, flips to the numerator, and I get 2x. Then I can substitute in the value at that point, which is x equal to 2, to find the derivative at 2. This is going to give me 4. And finally, I can write the equation of the tangent line at the point 2, 8, using the information I found in the problem. Before we continue our discussion and move into why we use this particular rule, we want to take a look at the graph of the functions in example 3, x squared plus 4 and the square root of x minus 4 and verify on the graph that they are inverses of each other across the identity function, and that the tangent line we found is in fact the right one. Let's move over to the graph. When you're looking at the graph here, you can see that I've graphed the function square root of x minus four here in blue, or actually I guess that's the inverse. I may have these labeled backwards. And this is the function x squared plus four. No, I think that is the one. Yes, this is the inverse. So I do have them correct. 
the point we are interested in is 2 8, which is on the graph of the inverse function. And that means its mirror image is the point A2 on the function. Notice that if I folded these together, the orange graph and blue graph would match up and touch. If I fold along the identity function, the dashed red line. Notice that I've graphed two tangent lines, which are the tangent lines through each of the reflected points. The tangent line on the inverse function we found to be, if I can scroll down over here on the right, um, y minus eight equal to four times x minus two. We know that on the function, the tangent line will go through the reflected point, eight two, and its slope will be the reciprocal of the slope on the inverse. This is four. Then on our function, the reciprocal is one fourth. And we can write the equation of that tangent line here. Let's now move on to the next section. Again, this is not the most efficient way to find the derivative of x squared plus four, which we can tell by inspection is two x. But we just want to learn the technique so that we can now use it to prove the power rule for rational exponents. When we look at the power rule for rational exponents, we're thinking about powers on x, such as one divided by n or m divided by n. We want to prove that the power rule works for rational numbers as it works for counting numbers and negative integers whole numbers, in other words. In this particular problem, what we need to prove is that this power rule works. But in order to do that, we have to have the derivative of the inverse function. We're going to start with x to the 1 over n. 1 over n is the nth root of x. Another way of writing x to the 1 over n is using the radical form. That means that the inverse function must be x to the n power, since that would undo this particular problem. Now we're going to use the formula to find the derivative of x to the rational exponent 1 over n by finding the derivative of the inverse function to it, x to the n, with the function substituted inside. The derivative of x to the n is nx to the n minus 1. What we substitute in place of the variable x is the function x to the 1 over n. When you substitute this inside, notice that what we have is the relationship that we were looking for. When we do that, we end up with what we needed. Notice that we're taking the reciprocal of f prime of g of x, which is the formula for the derivative of the inverse function. This is going to give us the relationship of 1 over n times x to the 1 minus n over n. Notice the signs changed because I moved it from the denominator to the numerator. I can divide the 1 by n and the n by n to get the form that I was looking for. We can do the same thing for a rational exponent of m over n, something like the 4 fifths power. Again, we separate it into x to the 1 over n raised to the nth power. We apply the power rule to the outside. And then we take the derivative of the inside using the chain rule. This gives us the result we were looking for. This is the primary use for the derivative of an inverse function formula, along with the derivatives of inverse trig functions. What's a little surprising about the derivatives of inverse trig functions is they're not trig functions. They are, in fact, algebraic. 
This is the first time we've taken the derivative of a function and gotten a function of a different type. In the past, we took the derivative of a polynomial, we got a polynomial. And the derivative of a trig function was a trig function. The derivative of the exponential, e to the x, is another exponential, e to the x. The derivative of arc sum is algebraic, not trig related. Let's take a look now at these derivatives. We're going to define arc sine again for you. And remember, this is an inverse function to sine, which means arc sine of x can also be written with inverse function notation. It does not mean 1 divided by sine. 1 divided by sine is cosecant, not the inverse function of sine. Sine and arc sine undo one another and get you back to the value of x, the identity function. If we use the formula we have up above for the function f equal to sine x and the inverse of it, arc sine, then we can use the formula to find the derivative of arc sine. The derivative of arc sine is 1 over the derivative of the function sine, which is cosine with arc sine substituted inside of it. Now, the next technique is something you'll exploit quite often in calculus too. So let's take a look at the triangle that represents the arc sine of x. The arc sine of x is the angle whose sine is x. x can be written x divided by one, and because sine is opposite over hypotenuse, we know that that angle would have an opposite side of length x and a hypotenuse of side 1. This is the angle whose sine gives me x. Then I can use the Pythagorean theorem to find the third side, square root of 1 minus x squared. This is the angle I'm talking about. So what is the cosine of this angle? Well, it's adjacent over hypotenuse, which is going to give me 1 minus x squared. That means that the derivative of arc sine is 1 divided by the square root of 1 minus x squared. This is an algebraic function, not a trig function. The derivative of the arc functions give you algebraic functions. Let's now find the derivative of arc cosine. We follow a similar process, except our original function is now cosine, and g of x is arc cosine, or cosine inverse of x. To find the derivative of arc cosine, or cosine inverse of x, we take the derivative of cosine, which is negative sine, and substitute arc cosine inside. Arc cosine is an angle. We need to find the sine of it and take the opposite. To do that, we draw a triangle to represent the angle whose cosine gives us x. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, so the lengths of those sides are x and 1. And we use the Pythagorean theorem to find the third side. And then we say that the sine of this angle is the radical 1 minus x squared divided by 1, and I take the opposite of it. As you might expect, with a co-function, the derivative of arc cosine is negative 1 over 1 minus x squared. In fact, it's the same as sine, but with a negative. We'll see that this pattern is going to persist. Let's now take a look at finding the derivative of arc tangent of x. Arc tangent is only defined between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, an open interval, since tangent of pi over 2 is not defined. Let's now write down the functions that we are going to be working with. The original function is tangent of x, and the inverse for it is going to be arc tangent of x, which can also be written with inverse tangent notation.
what we want to do first is apply the formula. To apply the formula, what we need to do is to represent the derivative of g, which is the cosine or arctangent, as one over f prime of g of x. The derivative of tangent is secant squared. This gives me secant squared with the arc tangent of x substituted inside. Now, arc tangent of x is an angle. So to find what this represents, I need to draw a triangle. When I draw a triangle, I can label the sides. Here's my angle. And I need the angle where the tangent of that angle is equal to x. Write x as x over one. Tangent is opposite over adjacent, which tells me the vertical side is x and the horizontal side is one. Then I can use the Pythagorean theorem to find the length of the hypotenuse, x squared plus one. The next thing I want to do is look at this and figure out what the secant of that angle is and then square it. In this case, when I'm looking at it, secant is the reciprocal of cosine. So it will be hypotenuse over adjacent or the square root of x squared plus one. This then gets substituted up above as the square root of x squared plus one quantity squared since secant was squared, which gives me one over x squared plus one. Again, we see that the derivative of the arc tangent is an algebraic function, not trig related. Let's take a look at the derivation of arc secant. This one will work together because arc secant is the trickiest of all of them. Arc secant has a point in the middle of the interval where it's not defined because cosine is zero at pi over two. So we have to break up the interval over which it's defined to be close zero to open pi over two, union open pi over two to close pi. Our function is going to be secant and it's inverse arc secant of x. They are one-to-one -one inverse functions of each other. To find the derivative of arc secant, I take the derivative of secant, which is secant tangent, and substitute arc secant on the inside. Now I need to draw a triangle to figure out what the secant and tangent of those angles are. When I draw my triangle, I know that the angle has to be such that the secant is x. Secant is reciprocal of cosine, so the hypotenuse is x and the horizontal adjacent side is one. The Pythagorean theorem gives me that the vertical side, the opposite side, is square root of x squared minus one. This is the angle whose secant is x. When I'm looking at this particular angle, I need to evaluate the secant of the angle whose secant is x, which would be x, and the tangent of the angle, which would give me the radical of x squared minus one divided by one. We do, however, have a bit of a problem. And the problem comes from the fact that X has different signs in the two regions of the interval. In quadrant one, it is positive, but in quadrant two, it would be negative. However, when we do this, we need to end up with a similar formula. We don't want to have two formulas depending on what we've got. So in quadrant one, we simply have one divided by x times the square root of x squared minus one. In quadrant two, however, we would have a negative one over x 
hence the square root of x squared minus 1. In this case, we see that when x is negative, we have to multiply by a negative in order to get it to be positive. But that's the definition of the absolute value. So to write one form for the derivative of arc secant, we use the definition of absolute value. The derivative of arc secant becomes one divided by the absolute value of x times x squared minus one. Now again, why did this happen? In quadrant two, we know secant should be negative because cosine is negative. And the sine of x is also negative, so that matches. But if we were to use this formula here, we would have a bit of a problem. The sign of the principal root will be positive. So to make it negative, we had to multiply by a negative one. This is not something you'll have to derive for an exam, but it is something you need to memorize and commit to memory. I will admit though, that I do sometimes allow my students to write the formulas for the inverse trig functions on a note card because these don't come up as often as the others and it's hard to keep them committed to memory. You may have them committed to memory while you're working in this section, but it may drift away as you get further from this section. Here are all the formulas for the six inverse trig functions written in their U form with the chain rule built in. The derivative of arc sine of u with respect to x, where u is a function of x, is 1 over 1 minus u squared du dx. Notice the value of u has to be between negative 1 and 1 because sine only goes between negative 1 and 1. The formula for the derivative with respect to x of arc cosine of u is identical, but with a negative sign on it. When we look at our tangent of u, the derivative with respect to x is 1 over 1 plus u squared du dx, but any value of u is allowed from negative infinity to positive infinity. Notice that the derivative of its co-function, our cotangent of u, is the same as the derivative of our tangent, but with a negative 1. You'll see that the relationship between arc secant of u and arc cosecant of u is the same. Derivative of arc cosecant of u is identical to arc secant, but with a negative one. Notice that these two carry restrictions that u be greater than one, so the radical is defined in the real number system. Our textbook gives the less useful x form, without the chain rule, so I don't necessarily recommend using. Let's go ahead and practice the skills now. I'd like you to solve example five and example six and example seven. You could also do example number eight. You will need to use the chain rule and the derivative of the arc functions. Go ahead and pause the video and work out the examples through number eight, then turn the video back on and we'll work through them together. Let's start with example five. The outside function is arc cosine. The inside function is the line three x minus one. Let three x minus one be u and use the formula for the derivative of arc cosine. This gives us negative one over the square root of one minus u squared. So it becomes three x minus one quantity squared times du dx, which is the derivative of the inside function, which gives us a three, giving the final result highlighted in yellow. Let's now take a look at example number six. On example number six, we again have two functions, arc sine and the inside function is x. But because the derivative of x is one, we can just look at it as arc sine of x. 
we want the equation of the tangent line at the point x equals zero, which means I'll need to know the ordered pair on the actual function arc sine of x when x is zero. This is the angle whose sine is zero. Think of that as the sine of some angle, which gives you zero, and between negative pi over two and pi over two, only one value does that, the angle zero. So we have the ordered pair zero, zero. Now we need to find the slope of the tangent line when x is zero. We've used the formula for the derivative of arc sine to get one over one minus the inside squared, x squared. Once we have that, we substitute the value of zero for x to get that the slope of the line is one. When put into point slope form and simplified, we end up with the identity function, y equals x. Let's now look at example seven. In example seven, we do have a composition of arc secant on the outside and one divided by x on the inside. I know I can write one divided by x as x to the negative one. I don't know if I'll need to, but I know it's an option. I need to take the derivative of the outside arc secant with the inside one over x remaining the same, then multiplied by the derivative of one over x. For the derivative of one over x, I do want to use the x to the negative one form to get negative one x to the negative two, which gives me negative one over x squared. When I apply the formula for the derivative arc, arc secant, notice the one over x is an absolute value, and under the radical, I square it and then subtract one. This is multiplied by the derivative of the inside function. This gives me negative one divided by x squared times the absolute value of one over x times the square root of one over x squared minus one. Now I wanna be able to simplify x squared times the absolute value of one over x but I don't want to lose the information from the absolute value. I know x squared is strictly non-negative, so I can slide it into the absolute value without changing the meaning. x squared divided by x gives me x. This x is still inside the absolute values. When you reduce x squared times the absolute value of one over x, you get the absolute value of x not x. This is the final result highlighted yellow. Let's look at example eight. In example eight, we have the outside function being a square root and the inside function is the arc cosecant. To take the derivative of the outside square root, I apply one over two to the square root and leave the inside arc cosecant. And I multiply by the derivative of arc cosecant, which is written here. Since my u of that part is x and the derivative of x is one, I end up with what you see here. You could slide the arc cosecant and the x squared plus one into the same radical if you put the x squared plus one in parentheses or you distribute the arc cosecant. In example nine, we want to examine the position of a moving hockey puck on the ice, where T is measured in seconds, and the position S is measured in meters, given by the arc tangent of T. We want to find the velocity of the hockey puck at any time T, so we'll need to take the derivative of arc tangent. The formula is provided here. Then after we've done that, we want to find the acceleration, which means taking the derivative of the derivative or the second derivative of the position. Then we want to evaluate the velocity and acceleration at three points in time, two seconds, four seconds, and six seconds. Then we want to see what conclusions we can draw from the results we got for the velocity and acceleration at those points in time. You have the skills you need, so go ahead and pause the video, work it out, then turn it back on 
and we'll explore this problem together. Let's now look at our work. The function is arctangent of t, so the velocity is the derivative of arctangent, 1 over 1 plus t squared, since the derivative of t is 1. Then we need to take the second derivative of the position function, or the first derivative of velocity, which gives us the derivative of that rational expression. I chose to rewrite it as the quantity 1 plus t squared, all raised to the negative 1 power. So I could use the chain rule instead of using the quotient rule. When I did so, I ended up with the rational expression negative 2t divided by the quantity 1 plus t squared, quantity squared, which means that since time is always positive, the acceleration must always be negative since this denominator will never be negative. When I evaluate this at two seconds, four seconds, and six seconds, I can see that the velocity is positive in all cases. However, it is decreasing in value. Notice that the acceleration is also decreasing, but they're all negative. So in fact, that means it's increasing. Because the acceleration is negative and the velocity is positive, that means at each point in time, the puck is slowing down, which is what you would expect since once you strike the puck, that's the maximum it's going to have and it continues to slow down from that point. In our last section or the next section in this chapter, not actually the last section, but in our next section, we're gonna be taking a look at what's called implicit differentiation. There are times in mathematics when we're not actually able to solve for y, but we still need to describe the derivative and the slope of the tangent line. We'll use implicit differentiation to find the derivative when we're not actually able to solve for y. I hope to see you in that video.